Live as you were to die tomorrow. Learn as you were to live forever. With this, greetings everyone. Welcome to the first ever episode of Sunbeam English School Bhagwanpur podcast series. The theme for our today's podcast is so vast that we could not think of anyone else to quench our curiosity. So here we have with us Ms. Prathma Gupta, the Assistant Director of Sunbeam Group of Educational Institutions to enlighten us on the theme of cultural diversity. Ma'am has visited multiple sectors of this world and have bestowed with different cultures and cultural practices, met people of various countries. We welcome you ma'am. I'm Raj Lakshmi. And I'm Anil. And we'll be here with you throughout the session. Thank you so much for inviting me to this first ever episode and I hope I do justice to your expectations. Cultural diversity. Well, when we just look into this term from surface, we get to know about the distinguishments and diversity this world is bestowed with. If you can just enlighten us more about cultural diversity. I'll give you my perspective of it uh, because when, when you speak uh, cult about cultural diversity, you can probably go endlessly into it. But um, I would just see it in a nutshell, it is about celebrating differences. First, intuitively understanding the differences by being, I would say, a completely um, clean canvas. You know, you cannot talk about cultural diversity if you have preconceived notions in your head. So when you are, say, intermingling with people of uh, diverse regions, be it geographical, diverse thought processes, you have to go as a blank canvas because if you are carrying thoughts in your mind already, then you, you've kind of tagged them, you've kind of uh, put them into straight jackets and you will never be able to understand the essence of what makes them they. So I would say cultural diversity is, is uh, you know, opening up a Pandora's box in the positive manner. In the sense, uncovering the various layers and rightly said Raj Lakshmi, it encompasses history, it encompasses uh, traditions, it encompasses uh, folklore to a large extent, you know, um, stories and practices and belief systems tangible and intangible, handed over generations, you know. So a person uh, intuitively starts doing a, a thing. It, it's like if you go down to the Ganges, you will perhaps dip your fingers into it and touch them to the forehead. Likewise, for an African native, it could be some other practice. For someone in Malaysia, it could be something else. So it happens so naturally and organically that you do not even understand that you have carried out a belief that was passed on to you by centuries of cementing of that particular belief. So cultural diversity to me is not actually sitting with an atlas and, and putting people into latitudes and land longitudes and therefore understanding the color of their skin or the dialect. It is about feeling the essence of how people have emerged, how civilizations have emerged across the passages of time and celebrating the beauty thereof. Acceptance, I suppose, is the plinth on which the understanding of cultural diversity is based for me. That, that is my lens of looking at cultural diversity. Now ma'am, from 1757 to 1947, it was the rule of British Empire. So ma'am, how do you think foreign invaders have shaped the mindsets of our people and have shaped the culture of our country? There is, there is action and then there is a reaction. Okay, so if you introduce a little bit of science into history, into the psychology of the human behavior, we are what we are because and in spite of the conditions in which we were nurtured, in which our ancestors were nurtured. You choose to call them invaders, Manu. I look upon them as, as a stimuli that somehow fostered growth, both negative, both positive. When invaders come to you, the instinctive reaction of a race or a community is to protect themselves. 
from the invasion that is the the invasion of uh, the physical self as in there could be there could be war there could be battles but there could be an invasion of the senses also there could be an invasion in terms of the cultural practices in terms of the then existing patterns of behavior for example the the norms of the particular race or people or community that is so called staging the invasion also are different from the community upon which they are waging that invasion okay in the process of this exchange however violent disconcerting devastating it may be what will typical emerge typically emerge is the way human being reacts human beings or civilizations react to perceived threat and stress therefore if the invaders or the marauders are upon loot and plundering you will instill systems wherein women and children will be protected therefore certain situational normative behavior will come up which after the long after the threat has passed will continue to be a part of the psyche and the tradition for example if you look at children from the war torn landscapes of even today the slightest noise can set off a panic reaction can set off absolute phobia into them can make them anxious why because a small child in afghanistan or a small child in palestine has heard loud noises and has equated it with the loss of human life for years together prisoners who have come out of uh, you know concentration camps their ability to amalgamate themselves into civilization and society has been challenged so what happens as a result of the invasion what has happened to our uh, systems of civilization over the years because of the invasion certain practices have become part and parcel of our day to day life our architecture underwent a change so why are there so many fortresses in india the way they are built every fortress has a moat every fort has a moat and every fort has got an an exceptional place where when there is threat when the women and the children are taken to safety what is this this is some kind of a change in the lifestyle which has occurred because of the perceived threat if our language has changed and is now a rich amalgamation of the persian the arabic or or the english also you know if they have become a part of the way we speak language and day to day spoken language or even if today the pilaf or the indian pilau is a part of the british dictionary and mutton rogan josh is also taken there and they are they have turned the proverbial kheer into a rice pudding what has happened here there is a beautiful amalgamation so many what you call an invasion true maybe it happened that way but because of that what happened is a certain kind of culture grew which was richer which was definitely embellished in different ways because of the influences that were brought upon it by the people who were invading i would say your culture expanded grew and also acquired different dimensions because of it and today's india is a sum total of its past with one foot in the future and the eye is definitely on whatever is the rest of the world doing and the beauty of it is because of all these influences i am an indian but i am also a world citizen a little bit of every part of this geographical planet and its its uh, typicalities lives in me also because i have had visitors who have left their footprints not just on the soil of my country but also on the psyche of my people mom amidst it do you think that some of the other way the original culture is lost but then isn't it important to keep that originality with us the uh, beauty of originality is that it tethers you to your roots it gives you an identity you cannot be rudderless in the sea of the world 
forever seeking who am I, where do I belong to. All of us need a conscious thread of uh, evolution to claim as our beginning. Okay. Therefore, to preserve your originality is a must. You cannot be meaning nothing. After going through life, suddenly you cannot uh, sit down and start pondering where are my antecedents. You cannot let that happen to you, which is why we can't tend to cling to our originality. And there is also pride in your own history. You know, every family has that one heirloom that they have preserved for years together and it's, it's been a hand-me-down over generations and, and, and that kind of uh, cements your place in time. But to cling to it, to the exclusion of uh, progress, to the exclusion of uh, amalgamation of other influences which may contribute to your own growth and development, to cling to it without logic and say this is the best and that it cannot be altered and to become rigid and dogmatic about it, that is when the corrosion sets in. That is when a culture does not grow but starts to decay within itself. So yes, preserve your identity, keep the pride intact but remember somewhere in that identity that which you are trying to preserve is also a very, very native thought which, which talked about Vasudev Kutumbakam if you are talking about the Indian culture. It is not something which we invented 15 years back. Okay, when we wanted to be a part of the world economy. It is something which has been a part of our culture for, for centuries. So remember that. We mean to be having the world as a family and that is also an intrinsic part of our faith and our belief and our culture. So for any culture to be growing, to be progressive, to be growth oriented, you have to keep that which is good, preserve it, definitely. Be vehement about its extinction and you also at the same time have to reflect and do a deep think on what needs to be altered, not discarded, mind you. Because everything had a logic in its own time and place and it was relevant then. So you need to know what it is that you have to tweak to suit today's context and what it is that you need to preserve for eternity.